John Ward is our speaker this hour. Uh, I'm not going to go through his entire bio. He's got a lot of information there. I'm going to just talk to you about him very briefly. Uh, first off, I'm very glad <laughs> Brenna is here and here on time, John. That was great. He said, you just might be late. He texted me about it. <laughs> and he and Brenna have two daughters, Kaylee, Emily. We get to see Kaylee quite a bit because she now lives in the same town that uh, I do. John, graduate of Fried Hardeman, then went on to get a master's, now a PhD. Started out, when I first met him, he was the associate at Oakwood Road, moved to California. Somehow or another, they convinced him to come back here. He was at Bridgeport for a number of years, then down to Kentucky, and we reeled him back in from there. And now he's uh, down at Steelton. I guess you could say he's still the new guy around there. But I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of us who were thrilled to find out that he was going to be back here, and not just to get him to teach. Uh, John is one of our teachers, and if you ask me how much uh, he's teaching, my answer is not nearly enough, because uh, he's a very, very capable man, very knowledgeable, and I feel like we are so blessed to have him, and I know you will be as you listen to him. John? I think it's true to say that if a person cares, they're going to hurt. And the more a person cares, the more they hurt. And you know, I think that's a good quality to have. Because I think that's quality that our God and our Savior has. They care. And they've shown us they care. And there's hurt when there are those who have turned away from them. And so it ought to be something that as we look and think about the idea of that care that brings hurt, that we would have more or greater desire to care more so that we too might hurt over those things that would hurt God, those who are lost, those who need reached with the gospel, that we might have a greater motivation to reach them with the truth of God's word. I want to say first of all thank you to the elders, to the lectureship committee, to Andy for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak and it's indeed a great blessing to be able to do so. Each year when I come back I notice that there are less and less of those that you might expect to see here at the lectures and that we've seen at the lectures in times past. That includes those who would speak, those who taught, those who were directors, those who were members, very faithful members of this whole area that would come and support the school. But yet, that also can help us to reflect, I think. Ecclesiastes 7.1 says, and if we could paraphrase, it's better to go to a funeral than a party. And that helps us to understand that when we have a sobering thought of someone passing, the mention of Sister Sharp, and of course the relationship that many of you have with them. And uh, the more we know, and the more that we think about that, and the sobering thought of them being gone helps us to realize that we need to stop and reflect on our lives, and make certain that our lives are in a good relationship with our God as well. The Bible that we hold in our hands is the Word of God. And you say, why would you tell us that? Why would you say that? And in this assembly you might think that there isn't such a need to stress that the Bible is the Word of God. But yet, I think back to the beginning. And I think back to, indeed, Adam and Eve. And I think to the fact that they were told very clearly by God what it was that they were to do and what they were forbidden from doing. Uh, something that they were not allowed. Don't eat of that tree uh, of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. But yet, though they knew that and though God had revealed that clearly to them, 
we find them in a situation where Satan was able to deceive them. Satan was able to question, throw questions out to Eve that would cause her to question the word of God. So even in this assembly, but as we leave this assembly and as we go back to our congregations, we need to stress over and over and over again that the Bible is the Word of God. What do I mean by that? It's not something that's just another book. It's not something to be taken lightly, but rather it's something that we find is the only message that we have from God to tell us how to live in order to be pleasing to Him. I can still picture Brother Wayne Jackson as he would speak and as he would talk about the Bible and it being fitting together and he'd do this with puzzle-like precision. Puzzle-like precision. And I couldn't help but think as I listened to the lectures today and some of those from the other evening how everything that's been said has almost fit together in just such a way that it's been uh, hard to describe how that could be possible unless... It is the case that the men who are presenting, what they're presenting, are presenting what God has revealed in his word. And then we would have every expectation that that would be something that would fit together so very well. The Bible that we know, which is the word of God, it tells us that God wants all to be saved. We've heard it already, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God desires that we could all be saved. God's word also indicates that it is an equal desire that he has for men, that is males, and females to be saved. It's just interesting that our text today is one of those examples where the stressing is going to be that salvation of a woman. And when I think about what the Bible describes about the salvation of different women, sometimes I'm uh, amazed to think that our Lord was so willing to uh, reach out to those who many would have considered the dregs of society, the Mary Magdalene's. The woman taken in adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. But, though that is the case and we see because he came to seek and save that which was lost, sometimes we might lose sight of the fact that in our text, the woman who's going to be saved is not one of those that people would have viewed as the dregs of a society. But rather, she's going to be depicted as a very religious woman. A very religious woman who still nonetheless needed salvation. And so Lydia will serve for us this afternoon of that one that as we've sung together, tell me the story of Jesus, of what happened in her life when someone was willing to tell her the story of Jesus. And we know that scripture does reveal as we look at whether it's men or whether it's women, whether it's Old Testament, whether it's New Testament, that when individuals find salvation from God, that their response so often is to want to serve. We've already heard that today, haven't we? I think of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 when he appears before the Lord and his statement is, Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He'd seen the Lord, he knew that sinful man could not stand in the presence of God. But on that occasion and at that time, God chose to provide a way where his lips could be touched with that coal and he could have the salvation of his sins. And then when God says, I need someone to go for me, what does he say? Here am I, send me. Lydia is the example here in our account. And we see that whenever she is provided with salvation, what is it that she seeks to do immediately? She seeks too to serve in a way that's very fitting with how God would have her to serve. 
Now, mind you, please, lest I don't get this in later, please listen closely. I am not saying that the example that the Holy Spirit decided to highlight here with Lydia, I am not saying that that example is the only role that a woman could fulfill. I'm not saying that it's the only, if you will, situation where she might serve and in the capacity that she might serve. But I will say this. If people are going to try to claim that a woman can serve in a certain capacity, they had better have a passage from the Word of God. They had better have an example from the Word of God that clearly teaches that a woman can serve in that capacity rather than just trying to dismiss those ones like 1 Timothy 2.11 and others that have limited the capacity of women. And we see that our service that we offer to God, both as men and women, is divinely designated. It's something, of course, that is, we would say, differentiated. It's uniquely different, as Scripture reveals that to us. And we also see that though that is the case, you can't escape the fact that we, when we become Christians, are to serve. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or your spiritual service. And so we're not to be conformed to the world. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we see that both men and women also are limited in what God will allow them to do in service to him. Men can't even choose what they're going to do in service to him. And so we see that the way that we're taught that we follow God and that we serve him is number one through showing our obedience, as Jesus would say. And mind you, this is not a new concept. This is that which has been from the very beginning. If you want to have a relationship with God, Jesus will say, if you want to have a relationship with me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Commandment keeping is the way that we show our relationship with God. Does that mean there's no emotions there? No, that could not be further from the truth. But nonetheless, we see that we express our thanks to God, both through our obedience to him, and also in our service to him. In the book that we've been studying, for to me to live is Christ. To live is to serve Christ with our life. And so as we come to our text in Acts chapter 16, let me begin reading there just for a moment as we see that they had come to Philippi, verse 12, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And it says, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Here in the text we have an example of those missionaries. The we passages include Luke. And so we know that it is uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke who have an idea of what they want to do in their goals in preaching. But guess what? The Holy Spirit's going to limit them, isn't he? You're not to go to Asia. And there's that vision and the Macedonian call. And so they are going to come forth and they're going to see this situation that is perhaps because of the lack of a synagogue, most likely. No, of uh, the number of the 12 men that would be necessary for that. And so these women are down, if you will, by the river praying. And that's where those men will go and they will find them. And of course, we see as well that Lydia as she, in this example, in this passage of Scripture, she's going to show herself to be one who has many characteristics, many qualities that both women and men could learn from. 
And we hope to examine some of those uh, each as we go through this together. We know that each one had a specific role. Those men would preach the message. Lydia, after she would become a Christian, would do something that can be a great blessing and help in the spread of the gospel as well. And so not only were those men limited in what the Holy Spirit would want them to uh, go, where to go, but also we know that the Holy Spirit tells us that they were limited in what they could say and what they could preach. First Peter 4, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if it's going to be of faith, if they're going to speak, preach it and teach it so that men may be pleasing to God, Hebrews 11, 6, they must preach the word of God. They're not permitted by God to go beyond that which is written. And I would suggest today that so many who try to write and say things, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to go beyond what is written with their think-sos, with their questions that they think are going to help to imply certain things. And we're going to find that that is something that is not uh, permissible. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. You need to learn not to go beyond that which is written. Or if we looked at not just that, but also, of course, 2 John 9. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And so we'll look at this. We look at these limitations that the men had. And the limitations don't preach there. You only preach this. And there's hardly an uproar about that. But when we come to a limitation of a woman's role, then there seems to be an uproar that rises above the level of many other things that we see along those lines. I want, when we look not at this passage so much, but if you factored in other passages that people will use regarding the expanded role for the women, we see that these limitations of Scripture, when these people come up with their own ideas and their own thoughts, what they're actually doing is being disrespectful, of course, to the Word of God. And they're being disrespectful as well to the women who are highlighted in that passage and the service that they render. These women are rendering a service... And you'll have people who will say, well, that's not good enough. They need to be able to do more. When the Holy Spirit has said, this is what I want you to recognize. This is what I want highlighted. Is this which they have done. And so I think when that is the case, and you factor into also as well, that the scriptures are very limiting in what they reveal to us, aren't they? You could even see that in John's account of the gospel. About 30 days are recorded out of the three and a half year ministry of Christ. And John will even say that many other things that Jesus did were not written in this book. These are written that you might believe. But, but there were many other things that were done. So there's a limiting nature to the gospel to begin with. So what does that say when in an account of a conversion of a woman, something is highlighted by the Holy Spirit? To me, I would think that that would mean that it indeed is something that ought to be considered even more sacred or more of a godly quality if this is what God in his word has highlighted about a woman. When people try to today use those open-ended questions, and make no mistake, they use that to try and get you to think that there's an implication that it could be far much more than this. But we know that, again, when they do such, that they're doing that in a way that there's no basis, there's no uh, way for them to substantiate those claims. When they throw out their questions, we know that the scripture doesn't answer those questions right there in that passage. But we also know that scripture does answer them in other places. And so rather than assume that they would do things that aren't recorded that they do in a passage regarding them, we surely ought not to think that they would go contrary to the other passages that are revealed to us about the women and their role uh, just so that we might be able to have some type of idea uh, of something that, that ought to be considered today. 
something that is our think so's and our speculation and man's wisdom as opposed to God's word. And so we know that the answer that is found in a consistent way is that God has revealed to us what he wants us to know. Men may call it limiting, but actually it's not limiting at all. And it's not something that, if you will, that uh, they say, well, that you're belittling or you're uh, devaluing woman. Well, if someone just teaches what Scripture teaches about Lydia, I would suggest there is no devaluing of the woman at all in that case, but rather it is a mindset, a thought that reveals again what God wants us to know about this particular conversion. We'll also look, because the lectureship committee said try to work this in, actually they said to do it, I'm going to try to work it in, but it's that idea of infant baptism. Cover some thoughts regarding infant baptism. And what is infant baptism again? But rather this idea where they are trying to take something that God has not revealed and try to make it fit a passage and you'll find that nowhere else in Scripture is that concept even taught to be able to then say in this passage it surely must be the case. And so we'll look at both of those things. Let's go back to the text just for a moment if you still have it open. This is the second missionary journey of these men and it's from 16.1 to 1822. And they are going to a place that they've never been. And it's an amazing thing to think that the beginning of the spread of the gospel in Europe is going to take place on this place right here, this riverside, as they meet on this occasion. And of course... We read of a conversion of a lady who's going to be a lot and mean a lot to Paul if we understand the book of Philippians at all as far as all of those who are a part of this congregation, how much he loved them. But you're going to have those even in, a, I think, the next day. Tomorrow is the conversion of the Philippian jailer. It's always interested in me that Paul, as he's writing these, is where? He's in prison. He's going to, of course, write and one of the members of that congregation is going to be a former jailer, the Philippian jailer. And so there are all kinds of things that tie together that will help him. But there's Lydia, there's the Philippian jailer, there's Epaphroditus. But let's go through the text and just ask a few questions together this afternoon. As we go through and we see how the story of Jesus that was told to Lydia by those men who preached that which God had given them for their power, the word of God, how that impacted her. Well, first let's look at her along these lines and just some qualities that she had that we might want to highlight uh, even before the conversion takes place. Number one, we know that she was a businesswoman. She was that seller of purple. She was this woman from Thyatira. She was one who was influential in her community. Perhaps very wealthy as we seem to indicate or understand as we study about her. She was one that if we understand this process of bringing out this purple dye to make these purple garments would have been something that would have been extremely hard work and so she would have been a hard worker, a great work ethic, much respected if you will. But it's interesting, she is a businesswoman, but she is not a businesswoman that puts her business above God. Because here she is on this day, the Sabbath, in a place of prayer. She's not likely a convert to Judaism, we know that, but she's a God seeker. And we've seen others like that already, haven't we, in Cornelius. And so she is one who is uh, a God seeker. And even in her success in business, she is not a businesswoman who is so involved in the busyness of business that she wouldn't take time to be holy. She pauses. She takes time to be holy. And so when we think of that for ourselves today, we ask the question, are we the type of people who ever allow our successes or our business or anything of this life, if you will, 
to keep us from God. It appears that wasn't the case with Lydia. And so maybe we can learn that from her. She was not only a businesswoman, but she was also a worshiping woman. A God-worshiping woman, but with a limited understanding. She's not a convert. She's a seeker of God. She's praying. And like Cornelius before her, she's not a member of the body yet. Her sins haven't been washed away yet. And that's the very reason why the evangelistic team, why they're present there to teach her on this occasion. It's fascinating that this woman who's very religious needs further instruction to understand what God would have her to do. And who is it that's there giving that further instruction but Paul? Who was he? He was one who also at one time needed further instruction, didn't he? And so this one who received the further instruction so that his life might be changed forever is the one who's there telling this woman about her need. About the fact that though she is a very religious person, they see that even though she is a seeker of God, she is not saved. People may call her a wonderful person. People may call her a hard worker. They may call her one who's seeking after God. But it's very clear that at the point that Paul and them arrive, she is not in that condition we know of as salvation. And so even though she was great in the world's eyes, she was not yet acceptable to God. She possesses a great trait as this worshiping woman, which leads to the next trait that will tie hopefully these together in, and that is that she was a listening woman. Here, thought about the fact that she was one who, verse 14, she heard us. Obviously, one who was already seeking God, who was well respected, who was a great businesswoman could have the attitude of saying, you know, um, you know that, that she would think of herself because of those traits as being too high and too mighty to listen to a message from God. You know, she might say, hey, I think I've got it together. I'm doing okay. I don't need to hear what you have to say. But she was willing to listen. One who longed to listen, one who was able to be taught. As a matter of fact, the text will tell us that the word of God opened her heart. And the only way we're going to reach people, especially religious people, is to get them into the word of God, study with them, so that the word of God, the power that is in the word of God, can open their heart. And so I think about that. And when she heard the teaching of the word of God, what did she do? She obeyed it. She was baptized for the remission of her sins. She heard the power of God unto salvation, as Paul would call it in Romans 1.16. And what we can learn today is there are still people today in the world who are like Lydia. Do you know any religious people? I do. I know a lot of religious people. But those same religious people, we have to understand, are not acceptable to God. They're not saved. They have not done what God revealed must be done in order to be saved. And so we need to take the time to teach them. She's also a woman of action. When the message is presented, we know that she was willing to respond. You think about her being a businesswoman, and if she was a businesswoman, as it is indicated, and a successful businesswoman, she probably wasn't real indecisive. So when a message was presented to her from God's word, she knew she had to take action. And she responded to the message as all of us must do as well. And she was, as we see, a submissive woman. She did not stand upon her position in the community, her being a businesswoman or anything of that nature, or even as a religious person who was seeking God. But rather, she humbly submitted 
to the teaching regarding baptism for the remission of her sins. And she was an influential person as well. Because the text tells us that when she made that decision to be baptized, what also happened? Her household obeyed. They were baptized as well. And here's where we run into that problem where we begin to see that they'll try to teach that, well, uh, okay, this was her household. What's that mean? That means that her children, her infants, uh, were all baptized. So that would include infants in the proper understanding that we would be authorized to baptize infants today. But please realize that infant baptism not only is not found in this passage, it is not found anywhere in Scripture. And it's a completely contrary or foreign notion in the scriptures. Therefore, infant baptism is also disrespect to God and his word. We fail to realize that the original six-stepper, I'm not ashamed to use talk about the steps, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithful. The original six-stepper, God himself, because he's the one who revealed that, he is one who has indicated that there are certain things that are essential for a person to even be a candidate to be placed in the water, to be immersed in water. Jesus himself, he that hath the ears to hear, let him hear. Except ye believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I tell you nay, but except you resent, repent, you shall like his perish. Whosoever will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Those are those things that have to precede a person's decision to be immersed in water for the remission of their sins. And when we think about that, we know that there are no children, no infants who are able to follow that or to have those type of uh, abilities. They can't believe. They're not able to repent and repent of what we might say, nor confess with their mouth. But infant baptism is a failure because they talk about sprinkling or pouring, and i got to run through this pretty quickly, but it fails to respect the 116 times bapto or some of it derivative is used in the New Testament. To dip, to plunge, to dip in or under water, to sink, to immerse. People have just decided, though that's what that word is, we're just going to say it's okay and acceptable to God to just say we can sprinkle or pour. The Didache, 120 to 150 A.D., uh, talked about pouring the water on someone's head three times. That's the first reference we see where the departure from Scripture. Uh, 200 to 258, Cyprian said, Don't be troubled about the sick who are sprinkled. He was, he was trying to convey to the people who were worried about that, Don't be worried about that. It's okay. They're going to be okay. The first known uh, practice... Uh, Novation, 251 A.D., where we get that idea of clinical baptism where he was sick and so he needed to be sprinkled rather than immersed. All the way to the 8th century, Pope Stephen III, where you can pour water on infants' heads to the council, 1311 of Ravenna, where they said it's official human law. Well, that is true. They got one. It's official human law. That's right that a person should be given a choice of sprinkling or immersion if they're a candidate for baptism. They have a choice of many things, but they don't have a choice of that which God has already determined. And that is that a person, in order to be saved, is going to be immersed in water for the remission of their sins. And notice that all of those things, every last one of them, came after the close of Scripture. They were all suggested after the Bible was completed. After what God revealed for us to know was revealed. And so we know that just like in those matters of Adam and Eve, God had already spoken and it's true today. All we have to do is look at the scriptures. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized. Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized. Both of those are those things that must occur if someone is going to obey the gospel and be pleasing in the sight of God. And isn't it interesting that when you even go back to the Old Testament, there's a principle in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 139, your little ones, your children who have no knowledge of good and evil, 
they will enter into the promised land. What was the situation? The, the adults weren't, but the children who were innocent, did you get that? They were innocent. And you say, well, what about Augustine in the 5th century and original sin in Psalm 51 and verse 5? Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. I would say this, that's a poetic statement. It's a statement couched in a poetical uh, portion of scripture. And like another poetical passage, Job chapter 31 and verse 18, where Job says there, from my youth up, and it's implied the orphan from the context, from my youth up the orphan grew up with me as a father, and the widow I have guided from my mother's womb. What's that saying? What's that saying? That he has cared for widows from the time he was born? No, it's a poetic way of saying, if you will, that I've devoted my life to the care of widows and orphans. And Psalm 51.5 is a poetic way of saying the bulk of one's life is impacted by sin. And if the psalmist was teaching that little children were born into sin and had sin, then Jesus surely didn't understand that when he gathers in Matthew 18.3, the little children come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The innocence that's there. And then there are many things in the written lecture that you can look at where really it, the bottom line is it's a, it's a misunderstanding and a failure to accept what God's word teaches on salvation and that baptism is essential to salvation. And, and then even as uh, someone, I can't remember if it was Dan or who it was, talked about today, that this idea of circumcision tied them to the covenant. So they've gone to that whole argument now. That if you are, or you're not, and they'll say, we're not baptizing infants or babies so they'll be saved. It's so they can be a part of the, the family, so they can be a part of the, this religious experience that their parents are a part of. But whether that's the case or not, there's still no authority to be able to do that. And so we see. Then who were the ones who were baptized? Well, very quickly, they were the people who were old enough to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And could that have included children of hers? Yes, if they were old enough to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. But it's mainly the context and everything about it seems to indicate that these were women who were her servants, who were her workers, who were influenced by her, who also obeyed the gospel on that occasion because of her influence, which leads us to say, who are we influencing to be baptized for Christ? She is a determined woman, and here's where we see this beautiful picture of her desire to serve. We see that, it says she besought us. If you've judged me to be faithful, come to my house. And immediately she seeks to serve in a way that's very pleasing to God, in a hospitable way. And we see that highlighted on the pages of Scripture again by God the Holy Spirit for us to take away. And so she cries, let me serve. And we have to let people serve us. Sometimes we... Go to, I know Greg Yost, he was here this morning, his father, he talks about his father teaching him things as, as he's now the preacher, his father's passed on. But his father one time told him, when the lady offers you cake, take cake. She's, she wants to do this for you. You're hindering her ability to serve. And we see that oftentimes in, in differences. So Lydia's saying, please don't deny my service. And today... We need to let others help bear our burdens. We need to let others not be denied of service to us. And so she was one that we see also modeled her Savior. She was one who was willing to serve. Do nothing through faction or in vain glory, but with lowliness of mind, each counting other better than himself. Not each of you looking to your own things, but each of you to the things of others. What's that about? Difficult to do. How do we practice it? Have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Allow Christ to be your model. And we even see that later, the impact that this has in this occasion, in Acts 16 and verse 40, when they came out of the prison, where did they go? They went to Lydia's house. And so she indeed was a praying woman, a businesswoman, a worshiping woman, a listening woman, a woman of action, a submissive woman, an influential woman, a hospitable woman, a determined woman, and to me, when we see all of that, and as we see that God opened her heart through 
his word, he was using her to be one of those who could give those good gifts that he gives through others. And so our service is a gift that we can give. And like Lydia, we all have circles of influence. Your circle of influence is different than mine. And we can use that to help spread the gospel. But what Xerxes couldn't do 500 years before Paul, come in and take that land and take over that land, God, using his missionaries, came into that land in Europe and spread the gospel throughout that time. He used four preachers, and he used Lydia as our example for us to learn. And you think about that, and I don't know, there may be someone here who's a religious person, a religious woman or, or man. But you're not yet acceptable to God because you haven't done what his word says. If that's the case, we're offering an invitation at this time. If you have not yet been baptized into Christ, if you're not a son of God through the faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as baptized into Christ did put on Christ, you need to make that decision today. If you don't understand that, we're here to study and talk with you as well. If you are a religious person and if you will look to the word of God and if you allow someone to help you with that especially you can have your heart opened and find truth Lydia that woman of purple that purple may have had a different significance to her when and after her conversion because as it was often the color of royalty it would be the if you will figuratively the color of her king Jesus Christ but I suggest to you that there was an even more uh, important color to her, and that was the color of crimson or red, because it was the color of the blood of her Savior that saved her from her sins and allowed her to desire to live a life of service. If you have a need this afternoon to respond to the invitation, do so now as together we stand and as we're led.